John Hessen Clark September 18, 1857, to March 22, 1945, was an American lawyer and judge who served as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court from 1916 to 1922. <laughs> Early life Born in New Lisbon, Ohio, Clark was the third child and only son of John Clark, a lawyer and judge, and his wife Melissa Hessen. He attended New Lisbon High School and Western Reserve College, where he became a member of Delta Kappa Epsilon fraternity. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa in 1877. Clark did not attend law school but studied the law under his father's direction and passed the bar exam cum laude in 1878. After practicing law in New Lisbon for two years, Clark moved to Youngstown, where he purchased a half share in the Youngstown Vindicator. The Vindicator was a democratic newspaper and Clark, a reform-minded Bourbon Democrat, wrote several articles opposing the growing power of corporate monopolies and promoting such causes as civil service reform. He also became involved in local party politics and civic causes. His efforts to prevent Calvin S. Bryce's renomination as the party's candidate for the United States Senate in 1894 ended in failure, but he worked successfully to oppose the election of a Republican candidate for mayor of Youngstown who was a member of the American Protective Association. A. Gold Bug. In 1896, Clark's opposition to William Jennings Bryan's nomination as the Democratic Party's presidential candidate was so great that he bolted the party and participated in the subsequent. Gold Bug convention in Indianapolis that nominated Senator John M. Palmer later that year. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Progressive politician. Soon after the 1896 presidential election, Clark moved to Cleveland, where he became a partner in the law firm of Williamson and Cushing. The firm represented corporate and railroad interests, and Clark soon demonstrated his worth, replacing senior partner Samuel W. Williamson as the general counsel for the New York, Chicago and St. Louis Railroad. Yet Clark continued his involvement in the Democratic Party. His politics evolved during this period, as Clark abandoned many of the political views of his youth, including those involving states' rights, and embraced instead the program of the emerging progressive movement. Clark's political evolution during this period was facilitated considerably by his friendship with Cleveland Mayor Tom L. Johnson, who helped restore Clark's standing within the state party after Clark's previous failure to support Bryan's presidential bid. In 1903, Johnson succeeded in taking control of the state Democratic Party, an effort which Clark supported. At the party's convention that August, Clark was nominated as the Democratic candidate for the United States Senate. Though an accomplished orator, Clark's work as a railroad attorney, his opposition to Bryan's presidential candidacy seven years before, and his own personal limitations all contributed to his failure to upset his Republican rival, Mark Hanna, who won the balloting in the Ohio General Assembly by 115 votes to 25 for Clark. In the aftermath of his defeat, Clark reduced his participation in party politics, focusing instead on his legal work for a time. Yet Clark was soon back in the political arena, withdrawing from the partnership with Williamson and Cushing in 1907. His relationship with Johnson suffered after Clark supported the successful candidacy of conservative Democrat Judson Harmon for governor in 1908. In response, when nominating a candidate for the United States Senate race in 1910 Johnson passed over Clark in favor of Atlee Pomerine, the eventual winner. Clark's support for the incorporation of progressive reforms into the Ohio Constitution in 1911, however, helped to restore his standing among Ohio progressives. Clark attempted to parlay this into a second run for a United States Senate seat early in 1914, but he faced opposition in the primary from Ohio Attorney General Timothy S. Hogan and by the spring appeared to be in danger of losing the race. Judicial career Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Federal judge Clark was in the middle of his primary campaign when he was appointed by President Woodrow Wilson on July 15, 1914 to fill a vacancy on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Ohio created by the resignation of William Lewis Day. 
Clark was the choice of both Woodrow Wilson and Attorney General James Clark McReynolds, who felt that the position required a first rate appointment to deal with the backlog in the court's docket, and that Clark's high standing before the Ohio bar marked him out as a man of decided ability. Wilson also wanted a candidate who could be groomed as a prospective Supreme Court nominee, given the relative dearth of Democratic prospects on the federal bench after 16 years of Republican presidents. He was confirmed by the United States Senate on July 21, 1914, and received commission the same day. Clark soon vindicated their hopes in him, establishing himself as an effective judge. Though considered too formal and aloof by the attorneys before him, he cleaned up the backlog docket and won their respect for his ability. His work was of the highest quality, with only five of the 662 suits tried before him reversed, and none of these for errors in the admission of evidence. Clark himself enjoyed his time at the district level, finding his duties not too onerous and the variety of cases before him stimulating. Associate Justice In June 1916, a vacancy arose on the Supreme Court when Associate Justice Charles Evans Hughes resigned to accept the Republican nomination for president. Wilson wanted to fill the seat by appointing his Attorney General, Thomas W. Gregory, but Gregory demurred and suggested Clark instead. After having Newton Baker Wilson's Secretary of War and a close friend of Clark's speak with Clark to confirm his opposition to trusts, Wilson offered Clark the nomination. Though Clark was reluctant to abandon trial for appellate work, he felt he could not pass on such an honor and accepted. Wilson sent his name to the Senate on July 14, 1916 and Clark was confirmed by the United States Senate unanimously ten days later. Clark's years on the court were unhappy ones. Having enjoyed the autonomy of a trial court judge, he chafed at the routine of the Supreme Court, hating the arguments, the extended conferences, and the need to accommodate other justices's views when writing opinions. The record of his opinions during his five years on the bench reflected this dissatisfaction. While he issued 129 majority opinions, he also dissented 57 times in his short term on the court. While he enjoyed good relations with the other justices and developed close friendships with William R. Day and Willis Van Devanter, he had an unpleasant relationship with Justice James Clark McReynolds, one that subsequently contributed to his decision to leave the court. Such was McReynolds's animosity towards Clark that, when Clark resigned, McReynolds refused to sign the official letter of regret over his departure. Philosophically, Clark demonstrated an affinity for legal realism in his opinions. He often voted with Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. and Louis Brandeis, usually in dissent from the conservative majority dominant on the court at that time, though Holmes's famous dissent from the Abrams v. United States decision was in response to Clark's majority opinion. As a progressive, he supported the power of both national and state authorities to regulate the economy, particularly with regard to regulating child labor. His dissents on two cases, Hammer v. Dagenhart and Bailey v. Drexel Furniture Company supported Congress's authority under the Commerce Clause in the Hammer case and the Taxing and Spending Clause in the Bailey case to address what progressives saw as a major social problem. He also demonstrated his opposition to monopoly in United States v. Reading Company, in a ruling that became a prominent part of antitrust law. Resignation. Clark's impact on the court's jurisprudence was limited by his relatively brief service on it. On September 1, 1922, Clark sent a letter to President Warren G. Harding announcing his intention to resign from the court. His decision was motivated by a number of factors. Apart from his dissatisfaction with his work as a justice and his ongoing difficulties with McReynolds, Clark had recently suffered the loss of his sisters Ida and Alice. Moreover, having witnessed the physical decline of Chief Justice Edward Douglas White, he wished to avoid a similar deterioration while on the bench. Clark would have few regrets about his decision, and informed his successor, George Sutherland, that the latter was embarking on a dog's life. <laughs> Later years Topic. Campaigning to join the League of Nations 
In an interview three days after submitting his resignation, Clark outlined a new cause he wanted to pursue, convincing Americans that the United States should join the League of Nations. At the time, prospects for league entry were at a low ebb, its proponents having suffered the dual setback of the Senate's rejection of the Versailles Treaty and the election of the anti-league Republican Warren G. Harding as president in 1920. Clark's public pronouncements gave their cause a new life, and in October 1922 he became the president of a new organization, the League of Nations Nonpartisan Association. Modeled after the British League of Nations Union, the association's mission was to awaken the underlying support for joining the League that its founders believed existed within the United States and mobilize it to overcome the opposition to League participation. Through it, Clark quickly emerged as Wilson's successor in the campaign for League membership. Though Clark committed himself to the cause with a series of speaking tours, he soon faced a number of challenges. Expenditures quickly outpaced the association's funding, with limited resources squandered on building up an extensive organization. Though Clark organized a restructuring in June 1923, a far greater problem lay in his underestimation of the task he faced. Contrary to Clark's expectations, there was no latent undercurrent of support for joining the League, only skepticism and hostility to the idea. Addressing this required a far different level of commitment than Clark expected to make, forcing him and the rest of the association leadership to scale back on their goals. Focusing on the issue of entry into the world court, Clark continued to campaign for American involvement in international organizations and agreements for the remainder of the decade. Retirement By the end of 1927, Clark's growing deafness and frustration with the failures of the association led him to resign from the association's presidency. In retirement Clark remained vigorous and active with a regimen of reading and travel. He also continued to participate in public service, becoming a trustee of Western Reserve University. In 1932, he backed a clandestine effort to nominate Newton Baker as the Democratic presidential candidate, though after its failure Clark became a supporter of the New Deal and President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Despite misgivings about the methods, he sympathized with the goals underlying the president's Supreme Court packing plan, and at Roosevelt's request Clark made a radio broadcast in March 1937 in which he defended the constitutionality of the proposal. In 1931 Clark moved from Cleveland to San Diego, where he lived in the El Cortez apartment hotel. It was there that he suffered a heart attack and died on March 22, 1945. He was later honored by his alma mater by having a residence hall, Clark Tower, named after him on the Case Western Reserve campus. John Hessen Clark was buried in the Lisbon Cemetery in Lisbon, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> 